passagier van je kijk 17. Dinsdag sowieso een uh, gewone lesdag komen worden, of voor jullie ingeroosten. 
Nou, iets is covid dus dat is dat waarschijnlijk de dagen op dat we moeten vertalen dat je dan daar apart voor naar de AVA moet vertalen. Dus dan was dat die manier op dat bij de Netflix Friends is, pak die daar nog even apart in. Ja, ook. Maar die is ook dat is een keuze van. Sorry, wat zei je? Die is ook een keuze van. Ja. Maar die andere ook een keuze van die nu is. Je hebt twee mogelijkheden. Dat is zijn research of die discovery. Ja. Uh, als je zelf research wilt doen, dan moet je dus eigenlijk doen als het zo niet er een research proposal met ons wordt spreken. Zodat je meteen aan de gang kan. Oké, want dan ben je geen advies. Nee, omdat het dus research is. Dus er wordt verwacht dat je dan een research project. Ja, er zijn ook, uh, wat dat betreft, kiezen de meeste studenten al de praktische reden, denk ik ook. Voor Ideoscopy van Carla. Prima, een goede vrienden, maar hij is uit. We hadden vorige week een student, uh, voor een week, uh, vorig jaar een student, uh, Sebastian Groot, misschien ken je hem weer. Die heeft uh, uh, malware detection, doen we die graag eens willen doen. Die heeft een research project gedaan. Zo van alles wat uh, gehad. Of de, ja, soms twee, soms drie, soms één, soms als geen. Dus dat is in principe aan jullie zelf, waar je verkiest. Andere vragen nog? Ja. Ik weet dat het voor de week stond, noemen we mij. Van Engel Peek was die staat nee, online. Over een Albert. Ja, ik had je al gebeld. Mooi. Heel goed. Leuk verhaal. Leuk verhaal. Ja, daar kan ik helaas in. Ik, ja, ik heb van de gastlezers wel alles gehad inmiddels. Dus dat ja. is wel een paar Oké. Okay, dat was het. Dan uh, doe ik even de kat af voor de opname. Ja? Als je dat voor die man dan moet je het maar Ja, nee. Gewoon in beeld staan dan. Oké, okay, welcome to the last lecture. It's called Console Hacking for Fun and Profit. It's a big room, but nevertheless, um, I like participation from you, as you know. So, when I ask something, by all means, please uh, jump in. Tell me uh, your experiences on what you think an answer might be. Um, anyone have any idea what I mean with console hacking? I did give a hint. What is the relevance of, for us in security? Uh, using the uh, for yeah unintended purposes, as deemed so by the manufacturer, indeed. Um, it's particularly interesting because consoles are generally, well, the line is becoming a bit blurred, but they are generally custom hardware and custom software. And it makes them extra interesting. This is pretty much a summary in many ways of lots of the things you have heard over the past few weeks. So there's this very specific reason we do this last. So you will see a lot of the concepts that we've discussed over the past seven weeks or so. You will see them come back, make an appearance, and they are actually quite relevant for a topic such as this. So, um, I take it you're all familiar with these consoles. Most of them are, uh, I'm, I'm guessing, uh, is there anyone who doesn't have a console at home? Only three people. Okay. But some, uh, I'm guessing at least you three still have a mobile phone. And those are pre pretty much becoming uh, a generation of consoles all on their own. And it's still very much uh, hardware, embedded devices, and so on. So once again, the same principles will apply. So learning goals, this is particularly interesting for you. See, it's not a big list, really. Not a lot of learning goals at all. Just what you need to know for the exam. We're going to list them one by one. Use this to help you learn for the exam next week. OK, so the context for today. I try to update this every year, or, or Better yet, I try to update this and extend it every time I give this lecture. Um, we're going to do a rundown of a very old console all the way up to the consoles we're looking at now, the Xbox One and the PlayStation 4. These are not hacked yet, as you probably know, so it's more of a preview of what you can expect. Some final thoughts and some references. I would like to present uh, and also state uh, some questions as well. A lot of this material is comes from available online resources. Much of it is not my original research. I will tell you that now. So if you approach me and ask, how do I hack this new fangled super device I have never seen? Uh, it's not what I usually do either. 
Uh, a lot of this material comes from lots of other lectures, just exploring online resources, learning, and so on. And I have an extensive list of references that you can use to find out more. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, by all means, check out the links. There's uh, really some cool people doing a lot of interesting research. So, what would you hack your console? Well, as you uh, say it, Robert, generally you want to have full control of anything you own. Maybe it's a human condition, but at least for hackers, very uh, appropriate. You want to do whatever you want with it. That includes, uh, but it's not limited to running your own software. Maybe you want to change or upgrade the hardware or take it apart, who knows. Or you might be interested in doing bad things, naughty things. If you're a criminal, why not make uh, money off illegal copies? Or why not see if you can find a bug that you can use this for organized crime? Botnets, phishing, whatever. It's strange, but this actually happens. This has become a serious problem as well. Because consoles, as you know, they are always online these days. So if you find something, you have a large installed base of systems. Why not use them for Bitcoin mining or whatever? Um, However, not everything that will be listed is actually illegal. It highly depends on individual law per country. Or maybe just because you can see if you can break it, take it apart, put it back together. Okay, so as I mentioned before, consoles are pretty much just specialized embedded devices for this talk, and they have specialized software to some extent. So, homebrew. <coughs> Who owns an original Xbox and has heard of this? At least some hands go up. I also still have one. Um, much of the popularity of the Xbox after its initial release and when it was finally hacked, uh, the increase in that came from Xbox Media Center. It was a very low cost, cheap way of doing this. Computing clusters. <clears throat> it's quite interesting if you can use such a device for a computing cluster. Any idea why? Why would this be ideal hardware? Is it the GPU? Yeah, it's generally uh, reasonable performance stuff, but most importantly, it's cheap. Cheap, exactly. Consoles are cheap. It's nowhere near as expensive as buying a computer. Game designers like this. This is also uh, important. Why do they like this? Not every game designer is maybe or might be part of a big studio. Uh, or can't afford all the licensing, the license fees, and whatever comes with that, so they could develop on their own. The demo scene, anyone have an, uh, has anyone heard of the demo scene at all? This is pretty much people that have, <coughs> are uh, star programmers that excel in squeezing every bit of performance and trickery out of this, some kind of hardware, and they do it for shows and demonstrations and so on. Cheap servers, another good reason, <clears throat> especially for something like the Xbox, because it's under the hood, it's just a normal PC, so you can run a lot of standard software. The semi illegal things, unlicensed software or game copies. <clears throat> um, this is increasingly a problem, <clears throat> and um, by the way, even that a lot of the um, interest in breaking the security consoles has shifted towards this and game companies, sorry, console developers of course try to make it increasingly difficult to do this. Um, it's no longer that interesting for a lot of the demo scene people and homebrewers to use consoles for this and so um, nearly all of the interest now comes from breaking the security for bad things, unfortunately. Um, it, could, it could be stuff like this, semi-illegal, well, I said make your own cartridges, this is not necessarily illegal. For instance, if you're in certain countries in Scandinavia, the law says that you can do whatever you want with the system once you've bought it. So if you decide to make your own part, plug it in, and it contains your own software, fine, no problem whatsoever. Usually the manufacturer doesn't see it that way, but tough luck. Modding, this is uh, the general term for changing the behavior of the hardware and the software as well to do something else. Uh, We'll see some examples of that. Organized crime, I mentioned that already. Um, and like I said, the legality can be complex. Some com it, it can be anything from a country explicitly permitting you to do whatever you want with a console to um, 
examples like DMCA or <coughs> DRM, which it uh, says a lot about. DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act in the US, explicitly says that uh, you cannot mod a lot of stuff. It's illegal, and you can be arrested for lots of nasty things. An American law. Okay, some important definitions. I'll, I won't stay too long on this. Um, there are some, this trick is particularly important for something about the Xbox. I will talk about it later. Um, and why do I mention this? Not because it's necessarily important for the Xbox per se, but uh, the concept is a bit similar. Um, there are tricks that you can use with a CPU, and if, particularly if you've uh, heard about malware and so on during Olivier's talk. You might have heard about this. To address memory, parts of memory, you can say, I want this part of memory. And as you can probably imagine, uh, all CPUs have only a limited number of bytes they can address. And to circumvent that problem, they came up with concepts like bank switching, so you can address different parts of the memory. And it comes back to haunt the Xbox interesting. So, um, timing and lockstep protection. This is uh, not just used for security, but uh, you can also think about uh, watchdog. I'll get into that later. Um, generally, what you want to do is synchronization between some software, some hardware, and the whole idea is you have one part of the hardware that checks if the other part of the hardware responds within usually a certain amount of time to some form of challenge. And if it doesn't, you assume that something is wrong. The, of course, for very, there could be various things wrong. That doesn't necessarily state that. But you could use that for simple forms of detection of illegal software hardware. If you make this challenge response mechanism or this hardware closed source or uh, a company secret, nobody else can make the other side, for instance, if you put this on a cartridge, to correctly communicate with the rest of the machine. <coughs> But you can understand that implementation can be fragile, it's still hardware in some cases, or if it's software, well, software, you can probably hack this. It's an example of that too. There's kernel versus user mode. Kernel means full, full access to the hardware, you can circumvent the operating system, you can do anything you want directly speaking to the hardware. And you have user mode, which is what Normally your stuff runs out there and it has to talk to some form of operating system or set of interfaces to ask for resources. Memory. The hypervisor, <coughs> this goes one step further, more or less. <coughs> it's the uh, technology that's used by virtualization to make sure you can run, for instance, multiple operating systems on one CPU completely split from each other. And without the operating system noticing this. But you can also quite effectively use this for security because if you start implementing your security systems in this hypervisor outside of the reach of the operating system and the rest running on the console, it's nobody, <coughs> in theory, nobody could access this, this security chain system. Okay. So, has anyone seen this thing before? The original Nintendo. Yeah. Show of hands? One, two, three, ninety. Who still has one? Awesome. It's uh, based on the same CPU as the Commodore 64. You might have heard of that one as well. And it's actually surprisingly powerful, considering it's from 1983. It's really, really old. I'm actually a bit surprised if a lot of you know this. It's 33, uh, no, 31 years ago, after all. Um, it has a lot of memory, both video and normal memory, for this for this day and age. <coughs> it's of course nothing at all, but in 1983 this was quite a bit. It had a lot of colors. It could address a lot of memory of the cartridges. This is the uh, European version, so it's uh, most likely the version you saw. There's also a white and red edition, which has the cartridges that go into the top, which is a Japanese family computer thingy. The Famicom, and well, if you've seen it, you know you, you've seen the games. Those were very advanced for for their once again for their day and age. 
Okay. So CPU, and my first question to you is why is there a difference in the speed between the European and the Japan USA version? And this comes back into video as well. And in the resolution. I'm hearing a lot of interesting stuff in the front row. Very close. Your initial comment. Specifically, what is what is that? All. Yeah, video protocol is not even that bad of a definition. It's the uh, a set of rules which how the, uh, which define how the TV signal is generated and interpreted by the TV. And for Japan, you would say this is different. It's called NTSC. Yeah. And if you're lucky, you're in France and you have Seicom. And then some other parts. This is even weirder. Um, and in Russia, we also have interesting uh, variants. <coughs> so, why does this cause a difference in speed? What is the refresh rate of TV? All TV, European TV. It's directly linked to what? 50 hertz indeed, propel. It's the same as what in Europe? It's, so it's, it's to make things easy, really, technology-wise. 50 hertz is the same as what else? We all use it every day, lots of it. Power, yes, the power lines, 50 hertz. And in Japan and USA, it's 60 hertz. And it's also used for timing purposes. It's as simple as that, really. And why does this cause a difference in speed? Because the rest of the machine also operates at this different speed. It means the clock crystal that is used for all this, uh, the timings in the console also slightly causes these slight deviations in run speed and so on. This is also where there's a different, uh, sorry, uh, a difference in resolution of the TV screen. Well, it's generally considered to be higher resolution and a slightly nicer picture as a result. Audio, five channels, there's no uh, actual um, example of that now, but it has a very unique sound. This is because this is just very simple circuitry, there is no digital. A lot goes basically in these chips. So you get a bit of a almost like noise from the fact that you use electronics, which cause a distinctive sound, much like the Commodore. So it's pretty good for 1983. It really is. If you look at comparable consoles and so, and so far from the time, Nintendo was smart enough to choose hardware that they knew they could work with for quite a while. So why would you hack it? Obvious reasons. First of all, these timing problems are serious, a serious issue if you want to play a nice car that you might have bought in the US or Japan. <clears throat> maybe you want to play unlicensed cartridges for all your own. Maybe you want to develop your own cartridges. And basically, you're out to circumvent Nintendo because who's heard of the uh, Nintendo scene of football? If you've seen these old cartridges, near, all these cartridges have this small star-like logo. And why did this Nintendo? Why did Nintendo do this? Here's a small hint: they wanted to control which games were released on the market, and they did this by this form of hardware protection we'll get into. So they made sure that every developer had to send them their games and software. They could check is there no offensive content, what we think is offensive. Talk about censorship in some ways, but okay, if we think it's okay, then we, we give it a seal of approval, and then we pr start producing the cartridges. So we control the distribution channel, the pricing, everything. Unlicensed game copies would be interested, but you can probably imagine it's not that easy to start replicating your complete cartridges. But this took a, while, a little bit longer, especially in 1983. <laughs> So how did Nintendo enforce all this? Well, there's, uh, there was a hint already in one of the previous sheets. They used lockstep timing protection. 
every cartridge you buy, official Nintendo cartridge at least, has this secondary chip, a very simple one. It's called the CIC ROM. There's a picture of it. It's really small. It does nothing really that interesting. Other than that, there is in the console a chip. And later it was done differently. Not relevant right now, but they have a simple chip mechanism that asks this other chip in the cartridge for it does a challenge, in other words, and it for a certain response. They run almost exactly the same code. And why is this? Because if they run exactly the same code, you accept you expect the same kinds of answers. It's simple to check that it goes in order. And this data is interchanged. So you can check if there's an official cartridge pretty much. So what Nintendo did was make sure nobody could make these CIC chips. And if nobody can make the CRC chips, Nintendo can pretty much control who can do these cartridges, mainly on the Nintendo. <coughs> so what happens when these, this goes wrong? You see this. Once again, if, you've, if you have this console and if you've seen it in action, you might have seen this before. It's easy to simulate. You just put in no cartridge. Which by default means that the CIC chip uh, is not present, there is no cartridge in there. So the end of the, the other end, in the console itself, tries to do this challenge response, never gets an answer. And the only thing it does is reset the CPU continuously. <coughs> and you get this effect, the blinking red screen. Oh. I hit it already. You can probably imagine once the cartridge gets older, the contacts get bad, uh, there might be dust, there might be other reasons. It might just break for some reason. And then you get this as well. Once again, those with experience, sometimes you need to reinsert the cartridge a few times. And for God's sake, don't blow into it. It's very bad into the contacts. Clean it properly with alcohol or something similar. If you blow into it, it starts degrading even faster. So you get this effect, it's quite common. So how do we solve this problem? Surprisingly simple. What do I mean with SNP? What wire would you cut? Reset light. What? Sorry? Reset light. Yes, you just cut the wire to the reset light. <laughs> Very simple hardware attack against this form of protection. So he's, he, uh, the console thinks, oh god, this is not an official cartridge, and it tries to reset the CPU. But if you cut the line to the reset line, the CPU does. It never arrives, so it never resets and it just keeps playing. So this is now obvious why the chip was gone from the S2 model. They wanted to prevent this form of attack. Emulation, just clone the hardware. Of course, this is a lot more work. You need to reverse engineer exactly what the chip does in every circumstance. A lot more simple format chip this is manageable, but this stays a while. And it's still reasonably expensive because you need to start manufacturing your own chips and so on and so forth. So what a lot of game companies that wanted to release their own illegal is a bad word, a bit of excessive word, but really wanted to release their own cartridges in general did was they came up with the idea of using a dongle or stacking. And particularly stacking you might have seen. As, what was the idea of stacking? Uh, putting in another cartridge, cartridge with your own. So it would see uh, the other chip. Yeah. What you would do is you would put in the, uh, the unlicensed cart. And on top of the unlicensed cart, you would have a set of connectors again which you would plug an official Nintendo card into. And what it would do is only the lines that were used for this CIC chips, it would read that from the official cartridge, and for the rest it would just use your own, this unlicensed card. So you would just be using the CIC chip of an official cartridge. What is the problem with downloads and stacking, though? Think about the, this is the same reason why you get this sometimes even with an official cartridge. <coughs> no idea, it's, well, it's, it's actually quite simple. You're even from a physical standpoint, you're just making the copper, wire, copper lines longer. 
So the chance that you get timing errors increases. So it can be a quite, quite a task to get one of these, especially, um, well, it kind of depends on how the hardware is, but it can be quite a challenge to get this to work if you start stacking these things. Okay, so that's a simple, simple form of protection, simple form of attack. So let's try this. So just by attacking the hardware, we can circumvent protection. Well, console manufacturers aren't stupid. They generally learn from their mistakes, you might imagine. So who owns a Sony PlayStation? Yes, that's a That's a really awesome console. Why is this uh, a particularly important console in the scheme of things? Sorry? Memory cards. Not memory cards, but... Especially with discs. Yeah, that's the first console that by default used CD-ROMs as the medium for games. <coughs> Philips actually tried to do this with Nintendo at one point, but that didn't work out for various reasons. But it was Sony that beat them to it. And this is actually a reasonably old console. If you look at the uh, list of consoles in the beginning, it's from 1994. So CDs were reasonably common at the time, but they weren't exactly mass market either, in the sense that everyone had one, a CD-ROM drive or a CD player and so on, even in 1994. If you look at the rest of the hardware specs, once again, Sony made sure that they had a console, very good design decisions, that had a lot of memory for its day and age, it had a lot of processing power, it had a lot of options, therefore, for what you could do with it. And Sony realized that if they wanted to, well, um, make the threshold for doing, for, for other people to start messing around with the console, that there would be a lot of value if they started to market their own versions of the console, which had certain features in it. So there are many different versions and revisions of this thing. In fact, there are even development kits at one point that got leaked, well, leaked. that got sold on the market, that played everything already. It's a development kit. But you have the ones that, most noticeably, a video CD playback, which is a precursor to DVDs, and uh, not bad at all. Yeah. So why would you? Imports, of course you have the same issues with PAL NTC. And Sony also had, um, much like Nintendo, they controlled a lot of the distribution channels and developers and so on. And many of the games were never released in Europe or in the US. So there was a big, big demand from customers in these areas for to play games that were never released over there and only released in Japan or even vice versa. Most notably, some games like Mother or Final Fantasy, there were several versions of this kind of games for these kinds of consoles that were notoriously hard to get a hold of. But <clears throat> Why would you hack it as well? Well, people, of course, see, hey, this video CD version is interesting, I want that, but it costs 50 euros more. Can I somehow change my existing console so it does this as well? Piracy, obviously, there were DVD, I'm sorry, CD burners at the time. So people thought, well, this will be an easy way of playing unlicensed, unlicensed game copies. So what did Sony do to protect against attacks? What was their security? Well, first of all, uh, they had very odd media. So, um, black guy, what, what do I mean with that? If you take an official PlayStation CD, what can you see? No? If you take it and you look at it, it's, it's black. And the other side is black. black. I don't know why they did this because it, I mean, it's still a CD, so it either reads or it doesn't. No idea. Maybe because it looks sexy or something. <laughs> but they did make some small changes to the format used by the CD. They created their own standard because the CD has, of course, a, we all agree on a way that we store the data on the CD which means we can all read it, there's just a problem call for it, red book, yellow book, there are a lot of names for this. And so we came up with their own uh, odd variant of this, which had leading codes on the CD, I'll get into that later, and they were mode 2 and then 412, 
format, which, mean, which meant at the time you couldn't read them in most normal CD-ROM drives. It would show up as a very odd structure of tracks. So what did they do? The leading codes, they decided to put in some information there. It is, this is a very simple form of region locking they used it for. This is actually, it stands for Sony Computer Entertainment, Americas, Europe, Worldwide. And they used this for region locking. So if they produced, if it was a CD that PlayStation game or whatever that came out in Japan, it would have a different leading code. And if you would put it in your European console, it would check this leading code and it would see, well, this is not supposed to be for me, so I won't use it, I won't play it. And because it's a leading code and it was written on a point where a normal CD writer can write, in general, this comes from the factory. <coughs> you cannot change it. You cannot just take a normal recordable CD and write your own leading codes. It is stored in a region where all the other basic information of a CD recordable is stored. Um, if you've written a CD, you can even when it's empty, you can get information from it. You can see it's made by this company. It's designed for these speeds, and this is used, of course, by a CD recorder when it actually writes. So Sony made sure that they stored the leading codes in that area. So it came out of the factory. There's no way to do that yourself. And this leading codes, they were verified very close, as soon as possible, by the CD controller chip. So, pretty solid system. I think you all agree. Good idea. So what does the controller chip do if it detects an error? It just holds the whole console. Tough luck. So, how would you attack it? Fake media. <coughs> of course, I mentioned they put this in the leading codes, in this area, in this information, like SCPD. But that is not going to prevent, it's still read this information, that's not going to prevent a company from looking at the CD and some nefarious organization or CD factory from, well, let's just start making writable CDs that contain these leading codes. And then we just need to market them to the different regions and people can just copy them and it will be recognized as a normal CD again. The swap trick, very clever. Has anyone heard of the swap trick with the PlayStation? Yeah. Yes, what does it do? Uh, you need to put a kind of a disk first, and you need to eject it and put the copy disk in it. Yeah, exactly. And the swap trick is uh, pretty much a timing attack, in the sense that you put in a normal PlayStation CD, and as soon as it requires some experimentation, as you can imagine, you need to find the right moment. When it's done reading the leading code, and it's verified the disk, you eject, simply open up the console, you put in your copy disk, and it just keeps running. So it's a very simple attack, but very effective. Mod chip, based on code injection, as most mod chips are, obviously, but how does the mod chip work? Very simple attack for a mod chip. At first you need maybe seven wires, but in the end you probably needed to solder three or something, yes? Chip analyze the required code of the disk. Yeah, exactly. As soon as the controller comes asking for what leading code do you have on this disk, or the security system asks for that, the mod chip just interjects and says, oh, it's this code. Regardless of what code is actually on the CD, it just tells the controller it's the right code at every opportunity. And hardware. People found out that once these development kits got leaked of the Sony PlayStation, that there were versions of this dev kit that just used some form of parallel port. It had a port on the back, PlayStation. And there was some kind of hardware connected to it that would turn it into a dev kit. So people just reverse engineered this parallel port cartridge and made their own plug-in things for it. <coughs> of course, they added all the, this also added features like video speed play and so on. So once again, it's, a lot of this was just pure hardware. Only a little bit of software, of course, the lead in checking. But that's about it. So the attacks, the security was not that advanced and the checks were easy to fail or certain way. So, Xbox, who has an Xbox? 
lots of hands as well. Awesome. Um, this is an interesting console for what reason in particular? So several actually. This is also very important as a milestone. It's uh, x68. Uh, yeah. First of all, it was based on standard PC hardware, yeah. including the video card. It's based on the NVIDIA video card. For what other reasons is it interesting? Hard disk. Yes, it had a hard disk, but there's some very uh, things that are not immediately uh, obvious. It was, yes, exactly. It was the first cons console that had this whole idea of being online, Microsoft's Xbox Live in its first version, where you could play it together and so all these things that we now take for granted with our console. Microsoft actually decided to run a very stripped down version of Windows 2000 on this, which is from, uh, uh, well, of course, obviously, a very much changed environment next library. First time, it's not necessarily a terrible, terribly fast console, but it's very cheap to make. It uses standard components as well. These are things are all connected, and they made sure that it was fully featured. It was the first console to have all this around, uh, lots of other uh, outputs for HDTV, which was pretty new at the time. So, all in all, a very nice console. This was, of course, one of the reasons that it was popular in academics as well. People would start building computing clusters from them. Because you could run PC software. So why would you hack it? Media Center, this, I uh, said something like this already. Um, and this had the added bonus that you could just use the built-in DVD drive like you could use a normal DVD player. All of a sudden, you did, not want, you did no longer need to buy the I think 99 euro costing Microsoft remote and USB plug-in thingy to do that. So. <clears throat> and this turned out to be so popular that even to this day we have Xbox Media Center, which is very actively developed and now available on endless devices. Homebrew, as I said, academics found this interesting. If you could run your own software on it, you could probably just run Linux on it and use it as a cheap computing cluster. Piracy, obviously. And Xbox Live, of course, you have these. There's always someone who wants to cheat and ruin it for everyone else. So if you can somehow influence what the console does, the software does, you can cheat. Well, the protection, Microsoft tried their best. I have to, you have to grant it to them. They actually, they looked at the experiences with consoles in the past and protection schemes in the past, and they realized that they would need to move to a chain of trust model for security. Not just use one form of, or one version, or one system of security checking, but a whole chain of things that all keep checking each other in some form or another, so you can make sure that at some point something isn't right, you can stop. Stop it from continuing to work. And to that end, they they did put in some protection on the media. That it was a custom DVD format, but it's a joke, really. Um, this was no challenge at all. It's basically the fat file system with some very, very simple modifications. It was very easy to read it. And it works in a normal DVD, right? The hardware and software, they went all out. They decided to have a secret ROM chip on the motherboard and a flash chip. And as soon as you turn on the console, this ROM chip, of course, kicks in, much like the BIOS. It would start verifying the flash, where the second stage of the whole booting of the console would happen. So it would immediately start doing security checks as soon as you turn it on. And of course, you cannot replace ROM. Flash on the Xbox contains something like a virtual machine, a hypervisor-like things. So first of all, you, you start making sure that nobody can circumvent the direct hardware access and so on. So Microsoft actually did some very good things. So they went with this chain of trust model. The CPU would start, it would go to ROM, flash with the bootloader, then it would boot the operating system after all these checks. And every step of the way, 
The previous step would verify that the next step was in order, signature of mass and so on. Think back about PKI SSL from Oscar. All this just checking would happen. And eventually, the last integrity check, of course, in the game, then okay, if that's okay, then we start the game. And if there's a failure at some point, you just panic the CPU, which is uh, like halting it, and it you ramp up, and even if uh, somehow someone uh, fails to continue execution again, you're at the end of RAM, and at the end of RAM, there's nothing else, so you just stop it. So that means if you want to hack this console, you need to some, find some part of this chain of trust that isn't implemented properly. And what possible targets are there? Well, of course, every step of this chain of trust is always the same with every console that does it. So can we replace the ROM? Can we replace the flash? Can we hack the virtual machine? Can we escape somehow with its restrictions? Maybe we can do analog attacks. Is it not chip enough to trick the system? Uh, are there any other weaknesses? Maybe we can just find a way to exploit games to circumvent the whole thing. Or is there an exploit in the operating system? All these steps, of course, are possible attack factors, as we call it. And maybe there's something else we haven't found yet that reveals itself when we start digging. So, Microsoft's intentions were fantastic, but execution was lousy a little bit at some point, unfortunately. And um, some of these mistakes were small, but some of them were small and really stupid because they, they are really of the category a simple Google would have shown this is not a good idea. So what did they do? Um, well, this is pretty common. You will see this later with the PlayStation Portable, similar things. If the original ROM is missing, it tries to boot from an external ROM. Why is this? Why was this done? This is, actually makes a lot of sense. Why would you have this in a console to begin with? A feature like that, if the original, the actual ROM that's supposed to be there is missing, why does it try to move from an external ROM? Hmm? Yeah, what did you say? To repair it, yeah. If the factory uh, needs to do something, uh, some kind of uh, diagnostics or whatever, this can be quite desirable to do that. Well, Microsoft fixed this in laser models. Obviously, it was a simple fix. They just needed to make sure that the, the pin configuration on the mainboard no longer had this spot where it would look for the external ROM, where you could hook up your own ROM. So this was fixed rather easily. Can you stop the buzzing sound? Uh, who's done that? I mean, I think it's me. Okay. <coughs> and um, Microsoft thought, well, <coughs> we also make sure that the flash cannot be overwritten. Once we, it rolls out of the factory, we'll make sure it's uh, no longer writable. But it was actually, as you can probably imagine, why not just repair the flash line and then rewrite the chip anyways? And of course, <coughs> it was also easy to fix move the flash chip into another chip. Both things into one chip, problem solved. There's also an attack, which we'll get into later. And the way they did their hashing in crypto was not very smart. It also turned out that Microsoft doesn't know how any processor apparently works, any PC processor. They didn't know about uh, how any recent processor works again. And of course, as you can probably imagine, the uh, operating systems in the games weren't exactly bug free either. So we'll just jump back them from one to one. So the actual hack of breaking the ROM thingy, the chain of trust of the ROM, just add an external ROM, you need to do some soldering, and ROM. Easy. It puts your own code in the ROM, and then you can pretty much do whatever you want. I mean, if you can put your own code, run your own code, there is no problem with security anymore. The chain of trust is broken. So what happened with the crypto thing? And um, I, I think some of the people who actually did all this research, they, they, said, they mentioned this something like, they, ex they suspected the Microsoft engineer that was responsible for this probably just 
Google's uh, tiny encryption and choose, chose to use this to do hashing. And encryption and decryption and hashing are two completely different things and they are not interchangeable. In fact, if you look at T, it explicitly says, I believe somewhere, do not use this for hashing. It is not meant for hashing. How did Microsoft come up with this T? Well, the name implies it already, tiny encryption algorithm. They needed something very small to fit into these early stages, small flash, small run, and so forth, to do all this crypto verification. And of course, if you do this as a hashing algorithm, and it becomes trivially, trivially easy to compute collisions, you can just replace the code that has just by accident the same hashing result, it gets verified as OK, and then your own code runs. But it was really easy to find a collision. You could run your own code, to chain of trust. And this was really, really stupid. They should have known better. This was just, this had to be someone who didn't know, or very little, know very little about crypto that they chose to do. Maybe under the pressure of a release date, you don't know. Like I said, they, they didn't quite understand how processes work either. That is to say, they didn't read the spec sheets either when they were doing this. As I mentioned, if the CPU, if, if there's some point of breakage, we point the CPU to RAM top and we halt it. And it turns out that Intel processors don't actually do this. They wrap around and start executing back at the base of RAM. And why do Intel processors do this? Because they need to be compatible with their older generations. And AMD actually is not compatible for this reason. I think in normal circumstances, you will never ever notice this because this is very unlikely to happen in any normal software as you can probably think. But this is quite a problem for Microsoft. And they didn't actually check this when they switched from the last moment from AMD to Intel as a CPU manufacturer for their consoles. So when the, if you would actually intentionally panic the chain of trust checking and the CPU would jump to the end, it would just wrap around and start executing at the base of memory. And there is no, actually when they could access this base of memory, they just started dumping the entire memory from that point on. And they found out that the virtual machine, they could start influencing it. It would never check this. It was never expected that it would have to check this. They started modifying this code a little in memory. You could jump to your own code. You would have arbitrary code execution and the chain of trust would be broken. It was just not reading the specs, not thinking about what a simple hardware decision can mean. And this was even weirder that they didn't think of this. This was standard PC hardware. And we had been doing this for many years longer than the Xbox existed. If you used to have an old CPU, an old computer, you would not be able to address more than one megabyte of memory. And to overcome this limit, at one point they decided to, does, does anyone remember these very old desktops, the IBM PC XTs? At first they used to have like eight, around 80 keys, and any modern keyboard will have like a hundred and something. And you would actually have to change keyboards as well if you switch to a newer model computer. Why was this? Because they, IBM for instance, they came up with a trick to address more than this megabyte of memory. By a sneaky trick, they would add an extra address line that ran through the keyboard. This is why you needed an extra keyboard, interestingly. A uh, different keyboard, sorry. And you would be able to slightly, you would be able to address 64K, just every time 64K from a different part beyond this one megabyte of memory by dragging it into this one megabyte area. So what did the people figure out? Well, if we start messing around with this A20 gate, we can change the areas of execution. We can just move this code that actually gets executed around. 
But once again, there was no checking for that specific area in memory. So you could just start putting in your own code. You get arbitrary code execution. And the chain of trust would be broken. This was also, this was just another example. Of not stupid is a bit excessive, but it was not very smart either that they didn't think of this. This has been in computers for, since forever. Obviously, um, there are many exploits in the games and operating system itself. You just need to find them. But once you start being able to access memory freely, you can find all these other bugs by just starting to dump memory to find all these extra exploits and so on. So you find so many more attack methods of attack to hack the console, it becomes rather trivial. Well, Microsoft thought, well, we signed the games. Great idea, but oops, they didn't think of signing something like the font center. The reason being was probably, how are you going to exploit the font? Of course, the font itself, no. But the font's handler, a piece of software that takes the fonts and uses them for displaying, rendering, and whatever, actually contain bugs, which made it possible to do buffer overflow. And since this is not signed and not checked, just by using a font, you can hack the system. Where do you know? This is an easy fix for Microsoft. They update the dash. So the font center is no longer vulnerable. The games obviously contain lots of exploits as well. MacWarrior, James Bond. Particularly if you've hacked your Xbox yourself, you're probably familiar with this. This was a very easy method of doing it. All you needed was this specially crafted save game on a USB stick. You would plug it into the Xbox, you would fire up the game. You just needed a disk for the game. And what the USB key would do, you would load the save game. The game would crash. You would have your own code execution due to this broken save game execution. It would execute all the stuff from the USB key. And off you go. But of course, you might think, well, that's not really that useful because we're running in user mode at the time. At least we can run something, but at least it's, it's uh, stopped. The problem, however, with this is that, first of all, Microsoft cannot fix this from the dash because it's the game itself that is broken. So once the game is out there, sorry. And, well, updating the dash, well, once you're at this point, you can just downgrade the dash again. So you get this uh, game of uh, cat and mouse. Microsoft comes with a new dash. You just use the exploit to downgrade it again to the vulnerable version, and so on. And it turned out that Microsoft made a very structural mistake. The games actually didn't. It turned out games didn't run in user mode. For whatever reason, they made everything run in kernel mode. Probably for performance reason, reasons, but even that's a bit, it's not really a performance issue if the game is the only thing running. You can, and if your implementation is good with the hypervisor, you can have an argument about that. But since they ran the kernel mode, it would just be easy to reprogram the flash and everything again. So. <coughs> Repro reprogram. Flash chip, like I said, it turned out that the game was running kernel mode. And it made reprogramming the flash rather easy. And of course, once you've reprogrammed your flash successfully, well, the ROM verifies the flash. The flash says, I'm good. And then the flash does whatever you want. It makes your code. And it was executed to whatever dash you were using. OK, shall we take a short break? Okay, short break and then we'll continue with PlayStation 3.
Especially those of you who have heard of the Sega Game Gear know that's 
RAM. Initially, it had 32 megs of RAM. Later models had more. Um, it has a surprising <laughs> amount of add-ons out of, right out of the factory. Bluetooth, mini USB, uh, infrared. You can even get a, a Wi-Fi module for it. Pretty cool. Four. However, it uses Sony. For some reason, decided to use uh, optical media called universal media devices, this, uh, with crypto, that is to say, but they use their own custom format for this. They, they're very weird, they're like a normal optical disc in a special sort of caddy. It's called a certain uh, uh, plastic shell that you put into the device and it runs everything from there. Uh, they didn't use cartridges, I'm not sure exactly why, like I said. Um, and it has, because the, the discs are not recordable, so. And it has an SD card slot, which is of Sony's own memory stick type. These were uh, slightly longer memory sticks. Why would you hack it? Obviously, homebrew. Particularly interesting uh, for the demo scene at the time. Reasonably powerful hardware in, in your hand. You can do lots of nice things. And because it would be a perfect device for a media center. You need to realize this is 2004. So if you can somehow have all your audio, video, and everything with you, and hopefully play it from, uh, from Flash, why not? It's quite nice. Piracy, well, despite their choice for the UMD, it's still an attractive target. Maybe I should say particularly because of the UMD, it's an attractive target. Because there's going to be demand for it, as a, as a criminal we know, there's going to be demand for it. And we still have this uh, flash option, so it would be nice if we could start selling some kind of device or whatever to play things from flash instead of these discs. So Sony, Sony aren't stupid either. They look at what the other manufacturers have done. So they see this, uh, that they, of course, there's a chain of trust, and they even decided to be extra smart, and right on the CPU package they have this whole, uh, they have additional hardware that does the crypto chain. And of course, if you do this on the same package, there's no way you're going to circumvent this easily. I mean, it's only reserved for a super high-tech, maybe electron microscope research institutes that they can even start looking at the chip. So, very good decision on their behalf. It's called Kirk. I guess it's named after Star Trek. If you look at the entire lecture of this uh, online at the CCC, <coughs> there's actually many other parts in the PSP that have similar names. Um, it makes it easy for Sony because if you have this in hardware, you can easily check every step that you can do it reliably if you have some, uh, some guarantee at least that people are tampering with it. And you can make it uh, simpler to prevent flashing of firmware. So you can uh, check that you that. So you can have loading restrictions. And Sony, of course, also thought about kernel and user mode separation and implemented this. So that it actually works. So, um, they learned from Microsoft in other respects. No user mode access to the hardware. No flash, no crypto module. Uh, it all runs outside your reach. Everything is encrypted. The save games, the updates, the operating system data. So that's all being decrypted on the fly, pretty much, most of the time by the Kirk. And not only that, they made it so that the encryption is unique for every PlayStation port. Um, I want to say that um, this place, it's actually quite um, complex, this whole chain of things around the PSP. So if you want to know exactly how everything works, just for the PSP and for all the other consoles, make sure you look at the entire talks. I'm really jumping over large parts of things, because we have a limited amount of time for it. But this is another, actually clever ideas, I saw. You can probably understand what this does. If you start encrypting things for PSP, you cannot just simply replace the flash of one PSP with the other because the encryption, the siding no longer matches. It will not work. So, obviously Sony still needs to be able to do this. 
update things. So they have a special format, a special upgrade mode, and they know how to encrypt and sign the stuff correctly. So it's a pretty solid model. If you try to do it, you get computers as no. Correct. So you can probably imagine where this is going. It started off pretty much like all the other attacks you will continue to see. At some point, someone discovers some attack vector that slowly gets, you can imagine like escaping from a prison, once you have a start, with one break loose, it becomes progressively easier to, make, to get more breaks loose and so on and so forth until you have a whole thing of to just step through. And this pretty much works the same for all this stuff as well. People found out that, someone by accident found out, found out that if you just put some unsigned code on the flash and it's in a normal Linux format, just take my word for it, it happily executes it. And they didn't quite understand why this would work. But someone was like, hmm, well, it's in user mode. It would be nicer if you could execute things from kernel mode, obviously. So you can find lots of interesting information. You can start dumping data, and the memory, and so forth. Um, so someone just tried this. Since this was in a standard Linux format, L format, they decided, well, let's just see what happens if we claim that we are a kernel one. And the PlayStation Portable happily loaded this unsigned code as a kernel one, which meant you had full kernel access from that point to run the code. So, hmm. But they did find a reason. Sony was under a lot of a most likely reason that this happened. Sony was under a lot of pressure to release this console at the time. This was in 2004 because Nintendo was also coming out with a new console and they wanted to be the first to market at the time. And they suspected Sony just simply either well, forgot, maybe not, but just had no time to remove all these features and they are remnants of development for the stuff they were developing. So the solution for Sony was simple. They just shipped a new firmware. 1.50 firmware, 151, 152. If, you have, if you've had a PSP or you have it, you probably recognize these numbers. After the 1.00, they came up pretty quickly with 150. And you had to upgrade or the game would blow. So, but you can probably imagine once you have this gap, you can start dumping the actual contents of everything, the firmware and so forth. And what do people do with these stuff? They start reverse engineering them. Just the basic, the same basic principles as you do with malware research. And they found lots of problems. I mean, we've had this discussion many times as well. You know, every software developer makes mistakes. So they found lots of race conditions, they could exploit overflows, of many different kinds they could use. So you got this cat and mouse game of new firmwares. People finding a new exploit, find a new exploit in the firmware. It leads to Sony developing new firmware. It's the people developing, finding new uh, exploits in the new firmware, and so on and so forth. But this is of course a, a game of cat and mouse that eventually we might lose. And not ideal, because it's a lot of work every time for the people who are trying to do this, keep developing exploits as well. So you want to have a more solid means of doing this. And it turns out they found out the in firmware and so forth that there was a service mode. And this is a I referenced this before, where where we, where did we also talk about this? In the previous console you had. It's a pretty similar idea. Yeah, generally it's, it's just a means of a manufacturer to have some kind of low level access if they need it to do diagnostics, repair, uh, whatever. So they needed to have, this is pretty common with most devices. I don't know, um, most of you have Android devices, but most bootloaders have features for this as well. So you can boot a device in a sort of a service mode, um, if, even if you had an old Nokia phone, there were codes you could enter 
and you would get into an uh, operator mode or whatever it was called at the time, and you could see a lot more information suddenly. A lot of hidden menu options would, options would be revealed, you could see antenna strengths, and lots of interesting information. This is very common, especially with embedded devices. And the PSP turned out to have a service mode. So, <coughs> of course, there were many people attacking this device from many different angles. And it turns out the crypto hardware could, in fact, be tricked. They found out that uh, the way it operated, it would just decrypt everything block by block. It's pretty normal encryption. But <clears throat> you could trick it to decrypt very, um, first of all, you could trick it to decrypt very small amounts of data. It caused collisions and so on. Of course, it just brute force it. All the usual stuff that goes with it. You could just make the search space very small, so you can start brute forcing things. And this, this meant that even if you, if you could somehow circumvent crypto, then you could start dumping even more information that would otherwise, otherwise be unavailable to you as a user of the device. So you start to dump the, the hidden boot, the flash contents, leading to even more reverse engineering possibilities. And one day, looked at this service mode, they found out that it only needed a specific serial number from battery. And how did Sony implement this? Well, first of all, the operating system actually provided you the kernel with a means to change the battery serial number. So if you somehow at the kernel, excuse me, and you change the uh, serial number of the battery, it would suddenly be in service mode through the battery, oddly enough. Why this why did it function? Well probably still for uh, easy maintenance in factories and so on, but this was not very smart in some ways. And you might think, well, why not just have batteries that don't allow this? As it turned out, most batteries actually simply had an EEPROM, which means you could easily write to it in general, just picking up some stuff and then writing the serial yourself which you very often. So from there on, once they started to be able to decrypt stuff and brute force things, and they found out that they could trick it into decrypting only a few amounts of data in the first block, and then the current assumed that everything went well. If they caused them, if they successfully brute force this somehow, this is actually not that hard if you look at the entire lecture, the search space is very small for decrypting. You could just jump within the same block of data that the Kirk thought was well, this is now safe data for me to execute. You would just jump to your own code in that block and you would have arbitrary code execution. And you could start downgrading the, downgrading the flash again. And the problem with this is this is a structural weakness. I hope you, uh, do you understand what I mean with that? This is how the machine and the hardware is designed. So you cannot just start changing this without breaking a lot of other stuff. So you cannot repair this easily at all, if at all, without breaking the normal user experience for people who are not trying to do this. So from there, it became, there was a solid, easy way to downgrade the flash every single time. So Sony meant well, but the way they implemented their own crypto was a mistake. They would never implement your own crypto. For God's sake, please use something that's off the shelf and proven to be safe. But this is, of course, a bit of a red herring argument in many ways because you can probably imagine that a lot of these embedded devices you are sometimes simply not able to use off the shelf crypto. So you're stuck with having to do it for whatever reason. So it doesn't always, isn't always that simple, unfortunately. But most of all, don't do security through obscurity. The battery cylinder number thing was just silly. It was that simple to use this venue of attack. And by the same token, don't ship development code. When people started looking at the firmware, they could easily start debugging all this and disassembling and looking that there were a lot of tricks and stuff that was left in that made it easy for, for them to attack the running code. So, the PCP is completely broken. 
Just out of interest, are there people, you're not on camera? No. Who is actually hacked our PSP? Several of you. So this is an out in the wild. We get to the PlayStation 3. Who has this one? So, okay. Who had this one or has one? Lots of people. Still. Um, this is, um, until recently, this was Sony's uh, latest console, now there's a PlayStation 4. It's um, pretty much a beast of a machine in many respects for a console. And this shows, if you look at the games and the quality of the graphics and the speed and all the features. Much like the Xbox 360, this is a serious hardware. It has a custom CPU still, GPU. It has a, a the GPU is particularly is a powerful in many respects. The CPU is a bit of an odd one. It's a asymmetric, that is to say, there's one general purpose core and seven floating point cores. It has lots of memory. You have to understand this might not seem like a lot of memory from a PC point of view, but if you, the only thing you're doing is running a bare operating system for exactly the hardware you know that's going to be underneath it. And there's only going to be a game running on top of that. You don't need that much. It's as simple as that. This is actually quite a bit. And it has lots of nice feature. It's even compatible with earlier versions. Some kind of emulation. Get an old one. Pretty cool stuff. So why would you hack it? Once again, homebrew. And particularly because Sony actually realized that a lot of the homebrew efforts were geared towards using uh, these machines as cheap servers, processing, computing clusters, and so on. So they decided why not just offer it right out of the factory. So once again, the threshold for starting to mess around with it becomes even less interesting to cross. We offer it right out of the factory with support for Linux, so people can do that. Well, yes, there was support for Linux. But it was not really interesting, because as soon as part people started running Linux on it, it turned out that you didn't have hardware access. Then what use is it for as a computing cluster? Hmm. Not really an interesting offering, it turned out. Piracy, it uses Blu-rays. We have Blu-ray burners. There's always people who want to play a licensed game, copies. Online cheats and traders, just like the Xbox, there's a PlayStation network, so you can cheat. New feature, the media center. This was also a particularly interesting reason for the uh, hacking efforts of the PlayStation 3. Does anyone know why? Because the PlayStation 3 does actually have some media center features, so we did try to offer that. Why was it still very attractive to do this? Has anyone tried the, uh, did anyone try the original media center features of the PlayStation 3? <coughs> it, it would turn out to be very limited in what formats it supported, the what methods of playback and so forth. So people were very much interested in supporting lots of other video formats. So that, of course, is an interesting and attractive reason for doing that. Sony, once again, you see, one step up again. Hypervisor next. And it's a good hypervisor. Linux didn't get hardware access, for instance. So that didn't help either. Once they wouldn't Linux, it turned out they couldn't find anything. For some reason, this makes sense. They would give once people to have hardware access through Linux because then they could start messing around with the console and maybe find out, maybe find the sensitive information. And then it's encryption and signing, hidden keys, only controlled by Sony. Obviously, it's used for, for signing, so people could do this themselves, sign their own code and have it executed in the PlayStation 3. And there's even facilities built in in the PlayStation 3 that other checks could be done. The Blu-ray could be checked on the disc. So this is a, if you have the Xbox 360, the DVD drive does something similar. 
checks if it's still legit. See. So the first hack was, and uh, well, it's not an actual hack, but it opened once again a, a lot of evidence for attack. Open it up. It was technically complex. There was a um, game of Hoss, is his name. He was messing around, he just opened up the console and he tried to. Um, he literally just hooked up wiring to the bus, to memory. And he would start ra ra sending random jolts of electricity. Damaging, of course, but see what happened. And if you did this in a specific way, you start influencing, of course, what happens in memory. I want to see the use It turns out that he, by accident, by glitching this bus, this memory bus, he would suddenly, from Linux, be able to see parts of the memory he wasn't supposed to see. So what he did when he realized this was, of course, he started to dump whatever he could find. He started mapping the actual contents of memory. So you can probably see where this is going. Once you have start to get access to the parts you're not supposed to have access to, even if you don't have kernel mode, but by accident you start seeing parts you're not supposed to, you get the interesting information. Sony's first reaction, ah, we'll just remove Linux. No more glitching for you, no more searching for this. And of course it's too late. I mean, once this information is leaked out, we're going to look at it. So the second hack, the jailbreak, who's hacked our PS3? Thank you. Thomas Hansworth. It was based on a USB key. And why? You should especially prepare to use Wiki, or you can even use your phone to do this. If you have uh, an Android phone with some mods. They found out that the, uh, the PlayStation just has USB ports. They found out that once you plug it in, of course, the things you, you normally see with a PC as well is that it registers the USB device, uh, finds drivers, of course, not Apple, but for PlayStation, per se, uh, finds the drivers, and it offers it. This is the device, and here's how you access it. And there were bugs in this. There was a race condition that you could exploit if you really rapidly inserted a USB device and then quickly removed it again, it would start well, crashing pretty much, but it would start writing to parts of memory where there was something just being removed and vice versa, just the normal stuff about race conditions and so on. And you could exploit this with success if you knew how to time this properly. So what this exploit does is you just hook up your phone, maybe, in this case, and it rapidly creates the devices and removes them through software to the PlayStation 3, and then injects the code and exploits it so you can do your own stuff with the console. Has anyone seen this exploit or used it? No? Not familiar with it? You jailbreak uh, method, USB methods. Uh, How did you hack it? Is this, uh, with uh, with the uh, USB. Yeah. So this this test is yeah. okay. So <clears throat> of course you get the same game of cat and mouse again. So he starts patching things, but it's too late because once you have this access, you just start dumping all the other software and doing code analysis and finding other bugs. So as soon as Sony releases a fix for the previous one, he had to take the next point off the shelf and bring out a new version of their hack that does this, allows for this to happen. So then Sony starts doing this to make it even less interesting for people to mod their consoles and then revoke PlayStation Network access if they detect that you're doing this. Rinse and repeat. So uh, if you're planning on buying a second-hand PlayStation 3, uh, you might get one that is banned from PlayStation, PlayStation Network. Be careful. <clears throat> but of course, once again, just like the previous example, you want a more solid and this will always work method. Okay. And Sony did use off-the-shelf crypto in many ways, but made some critical mistakes once again in implementing. So, they could do unsigned code execution. 
they could circumvent the, the security code processor and so forth. And they, because they were able to dump the code that did all the crypto checking and signing and whatever, the crypto signing checking rather, they found out that the random number generator that Sony used was implemented so poorly, which is why there's a reference to a CD comic in here, that it would give very predictable results. And if your random number generator is predictable, then at one point it becomes rather easy to start brute forcing private keys. And this is exactly what happened. Once people successfully dumped all the information and successfully brute forced the original encryption, they had access to the private signing keys being used for execution verification. And of course, if the private keys are on the market that are built into the console, you can sign any code you want. It will be seen by the console as this code is totally legit, and it will happily execute it. Very, uh, it's a damn shame that this happened. Seems legit, bro, yeah. <clears throat> and worst of all, you cannot revoke those keys. Because everything that was signed with those keys needs to continue working. If you revoke those keys somehow, people are not going to be able to run the original stuff that was signed with them. There's a, a Sony had some possible solution. Um, I mentioned this presentation specifically in 2073 CCC. Um, but this doesn't um, solve the underlying problem. There will always be this vulnerability. So the PlayStation 3 can be broken and is broken for good. So, Xbox One and PlayStation 4, who has one of those? Early adopters, only very few hands, I see. Um, interestingly, these consoles, hardware wise, are almost exactly identical. I don't know if this was intentional by Sony and Microsoft, but it's uh, odd that it happened. Um, they only slightly vary in uh, minor details in the hardware use, types of memory, uh, and some variants of the video card. But they, they're both, they're both in short like the Xbox, more or less standard PC hardware. And have the same uh, generic interfaces. And not only that, they use, or different per console, they use off the shelf, once again, in many respects, off the shelf, completely standard software. Why, does, why did they actually do this? Does anyone have an idea? Why did they choose to do this? This hardware choice, these hardware choices, these software choices, do you think? Hmm? Yeah, it makes it easy for developers, of course. But not only that. Hmm? Patching is easier. Um, patching easier, okay, yes, maybe. But uh, right at the beginning, it's easy, it's cheaper to develop. The console as a whole is a lot easier to develop. It saves a lot of the cost of having to do everything yourself, your custom operating system. These are your custom hardware. That's, it's really hard to make a profit on this, the console. So, um, oddly enough, the Xbox, on the, on the, of course, it's Microsoft, it uses Windows 8, DirectX, Sky. PlayStation 4 is uh, pretty much FreeBSD. It has mono on it, that's C sharp. So we decided to go with that. WebKit, uh, it's a whole uh, lead software suite for doing uh, web browsing, uh, among many other things. There's a massive list of what Sony actually uses. And they have to publish this because they're using open source software. They have to, of course, mention that. In other words, this is very nice for us. Hopefully, eventually, because they aren't correct yet, but for hackers this is nice. Because it means that you can pretty much be sure that from that all the software that is running on these consoles, if it's stock software, that if you find bugs in this, 
that, they, that there's a good chance, if it turns out that the PlayStation 4, for instance, is also running uh, the JPEG, that it's going to be vulnerable to the same kind of exploit, if you somehow manage to successfully do that. <coughs> There's been bugs in OpenSSL, there's been bugs in Z-Web. This is software and it's present. So there are many different interesting things to explore already, just by using the stock hardware and so forth. So the standardization makes it quite likely that if they start finding exploits, that the hackers will start using these to see if they can also break the security of the Xbox One, Xbox One the PlayStation 4. Like I said, at the moment, there are no, as far as I know, there are no, no working exploits yet, but maybe this year at the CCC, people will actually demonstrate that they broke the security. But you can, you can understand that it's probably just a question of time. That brings me to my final thought for today. All programmers make mistakes, and expertise is absolutely essential. I, I touched on this before. There is absolutely no excuse for misunderstanding hashing or crypto. The example with the tiny encryption algorithm is just simple. Or the AMD versus Intel behavior. I mean, simple audit, a simple audit would have revealed, oh, we've changed manufacturers, are we absolutely sure if we look at the spec sheets that we do exactly the same? Instead of assuming assumption is the mother of all. And Second of all, hackers have unlimited resources. You need to assume that they have unlimited time, and they do unlimited money, motivation, creativity, skills and tools. To, they will eventually find a way in. This has been the case every time with every form of security. Um, they bring, uh, there's a specific example. At one point, I believe AMD said, well, our memory bus is so fast, there's no chance that people are going to sniff information of the hypertransport bus. And I think it took a few months before some students at MIT and some researchers at MIT actually did that and said, oh, really? <laughs> so don't underestimate that. And certainly don't start challenging people like that. Open yourself up for it. For it. Um, and there's only secure or fully hacked. You don't have anything in between. You need to assume that once these halls are found, it's uh, usually a relatively short amount of time before something is completely broken. And certainly security through obscurity is never a good idea. The only thing you can do is work with hackers. Um, Sony actually tried to do this with their Linux support, this, this other OS option. But they revoked it. And that, I mean, even the, the point that they revoked was an indication, hmm, we must be onto something. So what does this mean? Um, in practice, and this is also recent when they moved to stand apart where and so forth, manufacturers try to get their return on investment before the console is hacked completely. And this is not any different uh, from uh, much of the other devices. I actually, um, I mean, it, it's gotten to the point that if there is a design for a specific form of hardware, and it gets shipped to China, for instance, for manufacture, the uh, factories. If you if you are the manufacturer, you, uh, sorry, if you are the developer and you ask the <coughs> factory to make seven million of these devices, there are known cases where they, the factory just simply makes fourteen million, and seven million disappear through the back door. There's a lot of other smart people that break all the encryption and find out how this hardware works and then make their own knockoff models. This is why you see all these fake iPhones, fake everything. It comes out of the same factory, same stuff, and they just reverse engineering. So for a company, it's principally now a matter of making sure that they earn their research and development money back before the device is fully compromised. Mm -hmm. Instead of hacking for other consoles, um, the Xbox 360, you can replace the firmware, there's a recent reset glitch and a mod for it. Who has a 360? Okay. The Nintendo Wii is also fully compromised. It has been also for a while. The DS, all the DS variants were that. 
you can, uh, Sony is trying to, uh, sorry, Sony and Nintendo is trying to stomp out the sale of these flashcards where you can just put a whole bunch of games on it and run the games from the flashcard, but of course that's not, never going to work. They cannot just ban that completely. That's probably good. So that leads me to the last one. Are there any questions? Okay, none at all. Awesome. Okay, the references. Um, the lecture will be up online. Hopefully, also the video. <laughs> and, uh, um, we'll try to get the video online as well. A lot of the explanations and additional information as well. But, um, I strongly recommend you look, if you want to learn more about this, to look at CCC presentations. It's where a lot of my own. Uh, uh, information which also comes from. And you can find a lot of the stuff in there with much better explanations than I can give in such a short amount of time. So, go read about how the Wii was hacked. Also very interesting, but lots interesting enough to also do in this talk. That's it. Thank you very much.